Now the other day, this channel hit 100 subscribers. And while that may seem incredibly trivial to some of you, in light of the fact that there are lots of channels out there with thousands of millions of subscribers, I personally couldn't be proud of the fact that there are now over 100 of you who have chosen to have me clog up your subscription feed. As a musician and a new starter to this platform, it is so incredibly gratifying to have people respond positively to the work that I create. So in order to say thank you, I'm going to address a question that's popped up a few times on some of the videos that I've created now, and that is how I personally make my own drum cover videos. So I'm going to go through in relative detail the steps that I take from start to finish to create one of my videos. So if you're looking to maybe get into creating drumming videos or you're looking for a different approach to the ones you already make, then hang around a while and I'll give you my best tips and tricks for putting your art out there in the big wide world. Now, considering this is some form of subscriber celebration video, it's worth pointing out that 80% of the people watching right now aren't subscribed. So if you do enjoy this type of content and you like seeing the resulting covers from the steps I'm about to talk about, then hit that subscribe button like you hit your favorite snare drum. No flams though, one click will do it. Okay, so step one is obviously choosing the song that you're gonna cover. And for me, there are two approaches. There's the songs that I really wanna play, and then there are the songs that the internet's telling me are kind of popular right now. I normally bias myself to the latter, the reason being that I can play what I want when I want when the camera's not on. But the camera's there for a reason, to show you guys what you wanna see, and I wanna make you guys happy. That said, I love to play pretty much what you guys wanna see, so it's not really been a problem so far. I would normally just have a look what's trending, consider the classics, and importantly, find something that's got a decent keyword associated with it. And there'll be more on keywords and the importance of those later on, so stick around for that. But once I have a song in mind, it's just a case of knuckling down, getting some rehearsal time in, and getting ready to record. Now when it comes to camera setup, this is actually something that I've touched on previously in one of my other tutorials, which you can see up in the top corner here, and it's linked down below in the description. But generally, my setup is a half-decent Nikon DSLR camera up the front, normally slightly off to the side to give a better overview of the entire kit. Obviously, it's at the front of me now, which is what you're seeing me through. But the other cameras that I've got are just an iPhone, which sits over here and captures a little bit of the toms and the snare and the hi-hat, a bit more of an up-close shot. And the other one that I've got is just a little Sony compact camera that sits at the top there and gives a much better overview of the entire kit from the bird's eye point of view. Now I don't bother with a foot cam as such, the reason being that I don't really do a lot of the crazy footwork and I find that actually the one that's above me there captures a decent amount of what's going on there. As a side note, I also don't use, when I'm at home drumming on this kit, the kind of dual beta compatibility that this pedal has. Partly the reason being is that with this particular setup, it actually forces my hi-hat foot a little bit too far over. And if you look at some of my cover videos, if you look at what's going on on the bass drum, you can actually see that when I'm playing, my foot sits down and to the right of the pedal. It doesn't look like I'm actually making decent contact with the pedal. The reason being that I'm used to gigging, and when I'm playing my acoustic kit, my bass drum is actually slightly further over than the bass drum on the E kit. So when I do have the dual pedal configuration, I actually find it a little bit obstructive on this particular kit because it tends to force my foot out a little bit too far for the hi-hat. And I don't have a remote hi-hat pedal when I gig, so I like to keep things as realistic as possible and keep the hi-hat pedal kind of central to the hi-hat cymbals. And now that I've pointed out the issue with the positioning of my foot on the bass drum pedal, that's all you're going to see in future covers. But anyway, back to the camera setup. Those three cameras that I just pointed out are what I use for everything, and I find that's pretty much plenty. I struggle with this one a little bit sometimes, it does slip around a little bit, for the most part it's okay. But other than that, once the cameras are set up, once they're relatively well framed, and I've turned off the pesky autofocus from the Nikon, I'm generally ready to press record and go. Now when it comes to capturing audio, I use this very slightly adapted Roland TD11K. It's slightly adapted because instead of having just the one floor tom pad with two zones, I actually split that out via a splitter cable and have two separate pads instead. And also you notice that I don't actually use a dedicated ride symbol in this kind of form. I just use this pad down here and it does me just fine. I think actually this is the most popular kit Roland have ever made. And I think that's probably because from a quality and price point of view, they're really kind of well matched and really well positioned in the market. 
Now it has been replaced by other newer models now, but it's good to know that this is a decent workhorse. So if you're looking to get started on these and you haven't got an electric kit, secondhand TD11 will really set you up nicely. Now it's worth reiterating something that I mentioned in my previous cover video, and that's that I don't actually use the module sounds of the TD11. Now you can if you like, there's nothing wrong with the sounds, and when they're well mixed, which is a topic for later on in this video, they can sound pretty good. I personally prefer using a VST plugin called Steven Slate Drums, which uses real drum samples that I can trigger with the pads instead. Now how that works is I just run a USB cable from the drum module to my PC, which in turn forwards that data onto the VST instrument within, in my case, Cubase, and then triggers the various samples within Steven Slate Drums. It's a super simple setup, but if you guys are struggling with it or you want some more information about how to get that set up, then you can leave me a comment in the comments section below or contact me on any one of my social media links and I'll get back to you that way. Now when it comes to the backing track, there are kind of two approaches. I personally tend to download tracks and drop them straight into Cubase and play along with them that way. Alternatively, you can take a line into your module or straight into the PC and record a track straight off your phone, let's say. Either way, it gets you a decent quality audio track to play along with for your covers. Now, an interesting point to note here that, that if you are recording from another device, to bring the volume of that device down and then jack it up within the audio software that you're using. The reason for that is that if you've got the input too high, you can end up oversaturating it and that then leads to clipping, which is seriously gonna deteriorate the quality of the end product. So to avoid clipping, bring the audio level down of the device that you're recording from and then bring it back up in your editing software. It's a lot safer that way. Now, one of the main benefits of using a digital audio workstation on your PC for recording these covers is that you can set things up like click tracks. If you've got a song, for instance, that starts right off the bat, there's not really much of a counting, much of an introduction, it's quite handy to set yourself up a decent click track within Cubase or whichever other software you use. And that way you've got a steady counting. And if you like, if you're more comfortable doing so, you can even leave that click track on for the duration of the song. Some songs that weren't originally played to click tracks you might find drift over time, so they're the ones you have to be a bit careful of. But certainly modern songs seem to be quite driven by clicks. So you can generally set up a click track and play onto that if you're more comfortable doing so. I personally find that sometimes that's beneficial. Most of the time I just listen to the music and I play along with what I'm hearing. That certainly works for the older songs where they weren't using click tracks particularly often. It's a bit easier to follow and you don't have to then worry about the click drifting over time and you can more just focus on playing the music. So once you've got that all set up, you're pretty much ready to hit record. And speaking of hitting things, if you hit that notification bell yet, do it and you'll be the first to know when new content like this gets dropped or a new cover's available. And when you've done it, hit the like button as well, just so I know. Now, once you've recorded your audio, it's time to get into mixing. So let's jump over to the PC and I'll show you what I do to get the best out of my sound. So this is a step that does take a little bit of time, a little bit of detail to get right. Um, a lot of the covers that I see posted online, they don't really pay enough attention to this part. And that's not to say that I'm an expert at all, but I do put some time and effort in here to make sure that things are sounding as good as they possibly can do. And you know, I'm constantly learning how to tweak and tailor the sound to get even better results. So it's not like you can either do this or you can't do it. It's a constant learning process. But here are just a few things that I've learned over the years of kind of gigging and, and, and recording that, that might help in this situation. Okay, so here we are in the project for my latest cover, which was Misery Business by uh, Paramore. You'll see on the screen there that there's three tracks. So the, the top track is the, is the MIDI drums, and that's what kind of gets sent from the, uh, the, the TD-11 into the PC via Stephen Slate drums. Um, it's basically the MIDI events that happen. So each time I hit a pad, a new MIDI event gets triggered, and that gets recorded on that track. The middle track is actually a guitar part that was recorded because this was a collaboration cover. I'll drop a link to Dave Rumble's channel who um, actually recorded that drum part, so go and check his out. And then the bottom track is the, is the original kind of drumless backing track that I'm working with. If you can get drumless tracks, that's definitely the way to go for this. Um, it saves a lot of clashing. If you can't get a drumless track, there are some things you can do with predominantly EQ that, that are really gonna help you out. The way that works is there's gonna be some frequencies within the original track that the drums kind of occupy. So whether it's the, the bass drum or the toms or the snare, within the frequency spectrum of that track, you're gonna be able to use a little bit of EQ to maybe bring down those specific areas for the drums. So you can remove some of that clashing that's bound to happen if you're playing with a track that has drums already there. The way you would do that, this isn't the best example because this is a drumless track already, 
but you can see within the tra track settings I have at my disposal this EQ setting and I can basically say where in that frequency spectrum I want to kind of be removing some of those um, drum frequencies. So for example, if I'm trying to take out the snare of a song, um, that might sit within this frequency area here. I can adjust the width of the frequencies that I'm taking out and essentially just drop them down. You want to be really careful with this. You don't want to affect the overall sound of the original track too much. All you're really trying to do is take down those frequencies where the drums were originally to make yours kind of sit on top a bit more and remove some of that audible kind of clashing that you get if you're playing alongside other drums. The reason being, nobody plays in perfect time. The original drummer never played in perfect time either. So you can be right on the click every single time. You could be like clockwork. And if you play to an original drummer track, you're always gonna have this slight phasing in and out of the original track versus what you're recording. So EQ can kind of help with that on the original track to narrow down those frequencies where the drums originally sit, bring them down so you can sit on top. Now EQ is also really important if you're recording to a drumless track because you wanna make sure you're kind of matching the tonality of the original song. If it's quite a, uh, a tight and, and kind of piercing song that's got a lot of kind of high end frequencies and not so much low end, then you wanna try and balance that a little bit so you sound more like you're in the mix. I personally prefer it when I'm kind of sat in with the song instead of sat on top of it. So I use EQ for that purpose really. If I jump into these track settings up here, you'll see that under an insert, I've got a studio EQ set up and I'm just boosting the highs here and I'm boosting the lows. I'm not really doing anything in the middle because this track doesn't need it, but what this track has got is a really kind of heavy hitting snare drum that's got a real crack to it. And also it's got a really kind of attack driven kick drum sound. So I'm trying to emulate that here by adjusting these frequencies and boosting those really high end and the really low end frequencies. And that can help me sit in with that track a little bit more. The reason being that I do all of this is because you're used to kind of hearing a track in a certain way and I could quite easily just record drums over the top of it um, and be done with it regardless of how those drums kind of sound and sit in with the mix. And I'm still gonna be demonstrating this is how you play that song on drums. But for me, the familiarity that you've got with listening to that particular song is more important. So I try and match that and say, okay, this is how I play it, but also it's in a way that you're used to hearing it. So the next thing I wanna to touch on really, again, this is specifically for the drum track, not so much for the original track. You can pretty much leave the original track alone once you've done a bit of EQ if you have got drums in there. But for the drum track, um, another really important thing is um, a little bit of reverb. Drums that sound too dry within a mix really stand out. They're a little bit kind of too clean. Certainly if you're playing with an electric kit or if you're playing via a VST, those samples are there predominantly to be as clean as possible. They don't have any effects or, or anything really kind of on them. They're, they're quite dry. So using a little bit of reverb um, just helps to widen out the sound to round out a little bit more and again it really helps it to sit within the mix a little bit better. I'll give you an example, I'll turn this off and I'll play just the drum track on its own. Okay and then I'll do the same thing but I'll bring that reverb back in. Hopefully you can just hear a little bit of a difference there. It's not particularly evident on this one because I've got it quite set quite low. You know, the mix is only at 30% um, and the reverb time is really quite short. Um, but it does, when it's in the mix, it really does make a big difference and just helps it kind of sit in there much more. The other thing that I've got on this track that's of interest, um, I'm not sure what tools you've got available on the likes of Pro Tools or um, another digital audio workstation, but there's a really nice tool within Cubase called Stereo Enhancer and, and it just exaggerates the width of the track, it exaggerates the pan of each element within the drum track and just makes the whole thing sound much, much wider. Again, I'll do a demonstration with, uh, without that on first. And then I'll bring that back in. Not the best point of the song to actually choose. Let's go back here. So that's with it off. And that's with it on. So that's a much bigger difference than the, uh, the uh, reverb that I put on there. So if you have got Cubase, then it's worth using that. It really helps widen the sound and make it make the drum sound bigger. Again, don't go too crazy with it. If you're playing a song like 
Michael Jackson's Thriller, for example, you kind of want things to be nice and short and snappy and centered within the mix. Um, if you're playing something like a ballad, you probably want much wider, kind of bigger sounding drums. So that's where that stereo enhancer can kind of help out. So while I'm here, let me just show you the Stephen Slate drums that I use. This is Stephen Slate Drums 4. It's uh, obviously a slightly different setup on screen to what I have in reality, but each one of these is just assigned to a MIDI note. Each one of these pads is assigned to a MIDI note that when I hit that particular pad, it'll just trigger a sound within within this VST. And there are lots and lots of different samples that you can use. So some people like to just kind of keep the same kit from one cover to the next. I personally think that the flexibility you get with this system is such that you can tailor the sound a little bit more. You can choose different samples and choose different tunings and things on the fly really easily. You can even do it after you've recorded, uh, which is a real benefit again to using electronic drums with a VST. So you'll find quite often with my covers that I'll be playing yeah, something that's cranked right up on the snare drum in one song and then something that's much lower and more uh, more of a fatter snare drum sound perhaps. Likewise with the bass drum, sometimes it requires a really punchy bass, other times it requires a really kind of mellow bass drum sound. So I like to vary things a little bit more and having the flexibility to do so within Stephen Slate drums using the electric kit is, um, is a real benefit. Now the other thing that I want to talk about when it comes to kind of conditioning the audio once you've recorded it is the overall levels of things. So it's very easy to not pay enough attention to the levels and either have the drums sat right on top of the original track to the point where all you can hear is drums. Likewise, it's easy to not have enough coming through on the drums and you end up not really being able to hear what's going on with the kit and you end up just listening to the original track essentially. So what you want to make sure is that the overall levels of both the track and the drums that you've overlaid are relatively the same. Um, it's just a good rule of thumb to kind of make sure that they're, they're fairly evenly matched. So really simple to do that. Within Cubase, all I have to do is just bring a mix console into the lower zone of the screen. And when I play, I can just isolate the drums out and note that they sit about here on the screen. Bring them back in, monitor that, make sure it's not changing too much. Likewise, so do the original track, see where that's sat. So you can see from that, my drums are sat just ever so slightly higher than the original track. So they're sat on top, but they're not way above and the track's not way below um, or vice versa. So when it comes together, it's a much nicer sound overall and you haven't really got too much focus on either the track or the drums. They sit in the mix nicely together. So once I'm happy with the levels, once I'm happy with the effects that I've applied and I'm happy with the overall mix, it's pretty much just down to exporting. Now a quick pointer for exporting, if you're exporting to MP3 files, then try and up the bitrate a little bit to 320 kilobits per second. The reason why that's important is that some video editors like to downsample the audio slightly if you haven't got your project settings correct. If you're using a WAV file, then you don't have to worry about it, that's ideal. But sometimes with a lower bitrate MP3 file, you will find that things become quite muddy once you start adjusting levels. So for the best output, use the best input. Now once I've got my audio, it's just a matter of editing the video together now and bringing those views from the different cameras together, matching everything up and exporting that. Now this can be where there's the least amount of work in the process if all you're interested in is taking the audio, taking the video, matching them up and exporting that as a whole. I personally like to add things like the intro, like the YouTube end card to promote more of my content, to add the different camera views and, and some crops and pans and zoom. It all really depends on, on what you're after. I use Filmora personally to do all my editing. If you're more comfortable just in Windows Movie Maker, then that's absolutely fine. It's whatever works for you, really. One thing that I do think it's important to add into your videos at this stage, though, are things like call to action elements, such as like and subscribe animations, as they just encourage the viewer to engage more in the video, to show some appreciation, but most importantly, to be aware of when there's new video content posted. So to reiterate, use like and subscribe animations to get the viewers to like and subscribe. Now, when it comes to uploading to YouTube, I'm not gonna teach Granny how to suck eggs. You all know how to write a title, you know how to write a description, you know how to add tags. But there are so many videos when you look for covers on YouTube that don't put any effort into those three things whatsoever. And the reason why it's important is at the end of the day, YouTube is a search engine. 
and the more information you can give YouTube about what your video contains, the more likely it is to recommend your video to a user that might be interested in it. If you don't have a description and you don't have tags and you don't have a decent title, then you can't really expect YouTube to be putting your content in the right areas. Now, what I use to help me with this is a browser extension that I mentioned in my previous tutorial called TubeBuddy. Now, what TubeBuddy does for me is it enables me to find those keywords that are more likely to get my videos sent to those who are interested in what I'm creating. For example, if I use the term drum cover in my tags and my description and my title, there are a million and one other videos that have that same thing in those three places. So I don't really stand much of a chance as a starter YouTuber of getting noticed. But what I can do is niche down a little bit and try and find something that's still being searched for fairly frequently that there is less competition for. And TubeBuddy tells me all of that information on the screen. Now a good example of this are the keywords that I tried to find for the previous cover that I did of Misery Business by Paramore. Now just using the terms Misery Business, Drum Cover, there are so many results that I don't really stand a chance of, of ranking at all. However, using the more collaboration focused title of Guitar and Drum Cover, yielded much, much better results in terms of search volume and competition. Now that's not to say that those videos are gonna shoot up and get thousands of views within the first day. It's not realistic to think that way. But what it will do is enable you to just boost those view counts a little bit higher than if you hadn't bothered at all. And I think that is evident when you look for covers on YouTube. Those that use decent keyword driven tags tend to do a little bit better. So if you do have the option to download TubeBuddy, the base package is free and it really does help out in finding what keywords are gonna help boost your videos up the ranks a little bit and help your channel grow that much quicker. And the final thing that I have to talk about really for me when it comes to uploading drum covers is putting decent effort into the thumbnail. At the end of the day, that's the thing that gets noticed first before even the title. So having an eye-catching thumbnail is really gonna help to get people engaged in your content and make sure they're clicking your videos over the competition. Now again, this is important because YouTube as a search engine, it looks for a parameter known as click-through rate. And that's how often people are seeing your thumbnail compared to how often they're actually clicking it. The higher you can get that number, the more YouTube is gonna promote your content. So having a decent thumbnail and making sure that people are clicking on your video is really gonna pay dividends and help your channel grow that much faster. Now you'll notice on my most recent three drum cover videos that my thumbnails have kind of taken a slightly different approach. I'm generally trying to create more of a template for a drum cover and then this tutorial will have a similar style thumbnail to my previous tutorial. And that way I can kind of generate some familiarity with you, the viewer, so you know exactly what you're expecting when you click on that thumbnail, whether it's a cover or a tutorial. But again, just to finish off, really put some time into your thumbnail. Don't underestimate its usefulness. And I really do think it will pay dividends in the long run. And last but not least, use YouTube's tools that they provide for you, such as info cards and end cards. Now info cards are the little elements that appear in the top corner up here. And the end cards are, as you'd expect, at the end of the video to promote more of your content, as I mentioned earlier in the editing phase. Now these really help to kind of maintain viewership and when someone reaches the end of your video, they're automatically presented with something to go and watch that's also yours. And the info cards you can use to promote any of your videos or your playlists on your channel. So it's a really good way of generating views for those videos that maybe are slightly older or are somehow related to what you're covering right now, or maybe that you just think the viewer will find interesting. Speaking of which, Here's a video of something that I worked on recently that I think you might like. So that brings me to the end of this video. I really hope you found it enlightening seeing how I create my drum covers. And I really hope there's something you can take away from this video to help create your drum covers as well. If you did enjoy it, remember to hit subscribe at the bottom of this video and drop a like, and I'll see you on the next one.